Good morning. Are we on? Thank you, Susan. All right. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the January 29th, 2019 Board of Supervisors. I'm going to call the meeting uh, to order and ask the clerk to call the roll. Supervisor Leopold? Here. Friend? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Chair Coonerty? Here. And now we're going to have a moment of silence and then the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance, Pledge to, allegiance the flag, to the flag of the United States, States, of United States of America, to the Republic, to the Republic, to the Republic which is one nation, under God, God, under God, with liberty and justice, justice for all. And now I'm going to ask, uh, are there any, thank you, I'm going to ask, are there any uh, late additions to the agenda, additions or deletions? Uh, yes, there are some corrections and uh, deletions. Uh, on the consent agenda, item number 17, there's additional materials. There's agreement 19C4357 with Brinks redacted. This is an insertion um, off after packet page 179. On item 23, there's a revised memo, packet pages 220 through 222, and a revised attachment A, packet pages 225 and 226. On item 30, there's a revised memo, packet page 247. And item 34, staff requests that this item be deleted. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and now's an opportunity uh, for board members to remove items uh, from the consent agenda. Supervisor Caput, do you have any okay. items? I just want to uh, comment on item number 31. I'm really happy to see that we're uh, making progress on increased transparency relative to evaluating how the homeless outreach proactive engagement services uh, program services are working. Uh, the effectiveness of this program will be greatly enhanced with our strong evaluation and, and subsequent oversight adjustments to the program, uh, which probably will be coming in the near future. So I appreciate that, and that's all I have to say. Uh, Supervisor Friend? I have nothing to pull. Supervisor I'm not pulling anything either. Okay, so we have no items to be pulled. Uh, now is uh, uh, an opportunity for public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the public uh, to speak to us about items that are not on the agenda or, or on our consent agenda or are on our regular agenda if you cannot stay um, to, uh, to, to speak on those items. And I ask, uh, if, if, if possible, if you are here to speak, uh, please line up um, and we will we'll take your testimony. Uh, German Supervisors Gary Richard Arnold. <clears throat> I'm again here to protest the Sovietization of the state of California. I think it's important to uh, know that uh, uh, the Committee for Economic Development calls for reducing local governments by 80%. Uh, Willie Brown. Uh, Willie Brown, which is sitting here with, next to Jim Jones. Um, Jim Jones was uh, mostly had a rent a mob up in the San Francisco area. Willie Brown in his AP report uh, called for all cities and counties to be run from Sacramento. Willie Brown, by the way, was the mentor uh, for Camelia Harris. In fact, he dated her uh, 30 years younger. Uh, than him, and we saw uh, uh, bad things, according to one of the candidates in Alabama for dating somebody uh, 10 years younger than him. Um, I also think it's important uh, that people know that uh, Mr. Uh, Coonerty went to the London School of Economics, um, which the very emblem is a sheep in wolf's clothing. Uh, the Fabian Society came out advocating regional government, which is AMBAG and ABAG and uh, the various regions. And of course, they're a, a socialist organization. They want to install a system of regional government um, to act as the ears and eyes and the mouthpiece of the central government. And we also find with the sheriff, <laughs> this is 
a little bit awkward, but the sheriff has adopted Nextdoor right on his website. Nextdoor was put together by NQTEL, which is the, investi uh, the investment agencies for the Central Intelligence and other agencies. It was put together by Grayline, uh, the Mossad, the CIA. You go to Grayline and they, they, they saw, show all the people that have worked in intelligence. The AMBAG system, the, the COGS, the councils of government, occur where people do not know. They meet uh, every uh, six to 10 weeks. Uh, McPherson's been there, Mr. Uh, uh, Caput. Um, they're not reported. The last time I went, uh, they only had five agendas for the public for uh, 13 cities and three counties. It's outrageous. They don't expect people to show up and they're certainly not welcome. Um, the whole state of California is put into a web of Soviets, and uh, it's called CalCog. So there's not a square inch in the state of California which is not intended to be uh, regionalized. In fact, the uh, Fabian Socialist Society uh, advocates that there be two levels of government with the smaller governments uh, being reduced. It will consist, or the lower deck will consist of simplified councils and counties uh, being superseded by regional government. Thank this you, is what you have up. been pushing uh, consistently uh, for decades. Thank you. I'll ask the next speaker to come forward, please. Uh, good morning, Council and Supervisors. Benjamin Kogan here. Just want to let you know um, that um, I'm aware of Agenda 21, which is a United Nation kind of mandate for uh, basically undermining our personal liberties and local government and um, AMBAG is regionalization and um, Gary just mentioned that there's ties that they're kind of linked together and um, so we just did the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag this morning and I'm a Boy Scout Eagle Scout so it's very um, it's important to me and it's one nation under God and uh, so I didn't pledge allegiance to the United Nations, and I don't follow leadership from the United Nations. I follow leadership from our elected officials who are representatives. And uh, so uh, Gary, I know, is here and is advised of United Nations Agenda 21. I'm also advising everyone here to take responsibility and look up Agenda 21. It's on the internet. It's something we can all be a part of to really bring localization, local government, local representation back to Santa Cruz and give the power to the people so that we can have the kind of uh, city that we want uh, run by the people. And uh, you can see the all the buildings and kind of the snack and pack housing and they want their kind of like little one world city, everything kind of controlled. The 5G is going to control all the little um, smart cars so they can be manned uh, without having people drive and they get their little city and we'll have a loss of freedom, a loss of power, a loss of, loss of property. And so if we really work together right now to create this community, um, we can really put ourselves on the map and stand that we stood for freedom, local government, local representation, and then um, really make the difference in the world. Because this will so branch out. New York will know us, and uh, you know the world will know us, and we would stand for freedom. So thank you as our representatives for listening and having public comment and uh, being able to hear this so we can create this together. Um, yeah, appreciate your time. Before I pivot, it, before I pivot into my public comment, I just want to be able to remind members of the public what it is to be a good flag waving Americans because we are good people. I want to believe that, right? The American public is tired of the political shenanigans. You know, the Human Service Department ride Alan Timberlake and Emily Bali with their political machination trying to criminalize my political dissent. Like I said, hey, you know, I saw them in the back talking to you guys. Dude, I don't care about them. They're ineffective and they need to be fired. How many other activists are they mistreating? You know, they take me through a malicious prosecution and the jury acquitted me. Right, for a bogus uh, uh, restraining order, has no uh, restraining order, right, from services. Hey, I'm being all press, everybody knows this. I go through this kangaroo court right here, you know, uh, right here, where the jury are all white. The judges are all white. Everything's all favored for white privilege. 
you know? Chris Hayes, right? And I'm not advocating for people to even buy this book because it's a waste of money, right? A colony within a nation. Here he is talking about white privilege, right? And it's horrible. I couldn't even get through this book, you know? Listen, we want to be able to, to and participate in our government. Self-government is really important. If we understand that you guys want to abolish self-government and bring in the regional government. The American public didn't sanction it, and it's not the will of the people. You know what I'm saying? It's a delegitimized enterprise, and we're not going to accept it because we're going to be dignified rivals, and we're going to stand up for our constitutional republic, for our civil liberties, and for our freedoms. We have every right. When I'm walking into this building right here, it says, welcome. We value accountability, and yet I come in here and I can't get community justice at all, right? They withhold exculpatory evidence. The DA is just corrupt. It's a corrupt enterprise. You need to stop funding those people. You need to start holding them accountable. You guys are healing administrators, you know? The American public is watching people like myself, Gary, and, and Ben because they want to hear the unscripted reality. You bring in all these design talkers, these functionary bureaucrats with their scams. We understand, I understand oppression. Hey, I read all day. I understand oppression. It's like breathing, drinking water, food. I got it. I'm a scammer too. But let me run systems. Let me run the, the public defender's office. Let me run the, de uh, the probation department. Let me run it, and I guarantee you people ain't going to be complaining. Because, hey, we're not getting our fair share. This is the only county out of all the 58 counties that, hey, when I come in here, I don't see people of color. I don't even see a woman up in here, which is shameful, right? When I'm in the jury, all it is is just women. They need a pull from the DMV, not from the voter registration, because most people that don't believe in the system don't register to vote. They should be pulling from the jury, from the DMV, so that, hey, we have a fair trial. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Wait. Good morning. This is just a quick thank you for the uh, emergency climate resolution that's on the consent agenda. Thank you from all of us and our grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers today? Great. Yes, good morning. My name is Satya Orion. I'm with a group called EMF Aware Santa Cruz. And I'm here today particularly to thank John Leopold for, for support of Anna Eshoo's bill. Um, it, it feels so good to have this recognition come. Um, this is such an important issue, this fifth generation of wireless technology that's being pushed by the telecom industry. Um, I am fully in favor of technology, but I think that there is far too much of this already and uh, without consideration for the many peer-reviewed scientific studies that are out there. I know the, uh, the FCC and the telecom industry work hand in hand. It's been well documented. Uh, I am EMF sensitive. It's hard for me to be here today because of the towers on the roof, the big one out there. Um, I'm not alone in this. There's many in the community. A lot of us don't come forward because people don't believe us. People who haven't experienced symptoms of this yet are experiencing it, the health effects. It's just not known to you yet. It was the way it was for me five years ago, and now I do believe because I've experienced the symptoms myself. Um, one thing I'd like that uh, I think it's wonderful that this you're supporting on issue, and I don't think her bill has gone far enough. I think we really need to look closely at this 5G, which is completely untested, these frequencies, and to educate ourselves more, all of us. I mean, I'm, I include myself in this as well. Our group is working so hard to learn as much as we can, and we would love to share what we've learned with you. I sent you a really long email <clears throat> a couple of days ago. I hope you got a chance to look at it, and I'd like to share more I spend about six hours a day researching this stuff, which is not something I ever planned to do, but because my health was so dramatically impacted by it, I needed to. So one thing I want to say is that those of us who are sensitive, it's really not fair to start. What 5G wants to do is put these towers in our neighborhoods every 500 feet, 40 per square mile outside our bedrooms. This is what was quoted to me by a planner in Santa Cruz, AT&T. 
said this in a meeting to them. And this is not, we, we have not consented to this. The public right of ways, ADA protections cover us as a protected class, those who are EMS sensitive. And that, that supersedes FCC <coughs> rulings. So I, I, I want to personally pursue this myself to learn more about those ADA protections. I hope you'll help us. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name's Alyssa Barnes, and I have been a 30-year resident of Santa Cruz. Um, I am here in support of uh, HR 530, the um, proposal that uh, the last speaker just spoke about from Anna Eshu, and thank you, John Leopold, for your support of that. Uh, I have worked as a massage therapist and a um, in the New Leaf market in the wellness area. So I've worked one-on-one uh, -on -one with people and their health quite a bit, and I'm also very interested in the health of the environment as well. So uh, I just really am here to request support for the slowing down of acquisition of new technologies, as we do have considerable scientific evidence that the technologies that we have right now are harmful to human health. And the crisis in human health, in our not just our society, but worldwide, really speaks to the fact that something's going on. So um, there are many examples of strong scientific evidence lagging behind the public knowledge and understanding. Uh, and this is due largely to big money interests, tobacco, asbestos, lead in paint, to name a few. These are all times when the science showed clearly that there was issues and harm, and it took years and decades for that to be well understood. So um, I feel that the slower acquisition of technology is really important at this point, and 5G uh, has a lot more to do with um, creating a condition where we need to purchase more items, more new phones to go with their systems, and so on and so forth. So um, I'm going to just go ahead and leave it there uh, right now, but thank you very much for this public comment time and for your support of uh, HR 530. Good morning, supervisors. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. My name is Tina Toe, and I am the field representative for Santa Cruz County for NORC at the University of Chicago. I came to uh, let you know that the National Survey of Early Care and Education is going on now until June. This is a very important research study. Um, it determines where funding is, uh, future federal funding is determined and distributed throughout the county. Um, and I wanted to stress the importance of letting your constituents know to participate in the study if they're selected. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can leave some information if you're interested. Thanks. Good morning, my name is Erica Miranda Bartlett. Uh, I'm here to just support, or express my support and appreciation for your thorough attention to the MHSA update, uh, item number 29. I really appreciate uh, the time and attention you've paid to this as looking sort of at the documents. They're really complicated, hard to understand, but it's so vital that this funding goes to the most vulnerable members of our community. So thank you, supervisors. Thank you. Hi there, my name is Tracy Kennedy, and I just wanted to um, express my support for the MHSA plan and to thank, um, thank you for continuing to make uh, peer services an important part of that plan. Thank you. Good morning, supervisors. My name is Adrian Bernard and, and um, I guess I'm just gonna chime in as well about supporting the plan and thank you for taking the energy and the time to, to, um, to invest in mental health and behavioral health. And, and, I, and I just wanna echo what Erica said about the most vulnerable population in, in our communities is, and how can we continue to further and support and promote more funding in this area. So uh, there's a movement on the horizon of sorts, and so thank you for being a part of it, and I'm grateful for, 
for, and I completely support the MHSA plan in taking, taking the time to fund all of mental health programs that were, are benefiting from it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Rachmat Martin. I'm a 48-year resident of this county with 46 years in John's district. I'm not a naive environmental fundamentalist. I began my adult life with a science and engineering education at Stanford University. I've spent two-thirds of my working life in the world of telecommunications. In the early 90s, I was a co-founder of a Silicon Valley startup business that bridged the world of the internet with the world of wireless data communications. I left the corporate world as one of the senior executives in that company about 15 years ago and went out on my own and began to help people solve problems in their lives. In that role, I began to receive questions and requests from people who were living with challenging issues such as they could not sleep any longer at night or they had uncomfortable buzzing in their brains during the day. I acquired instruments that enabled me to measure for extensive dirty electricity, EMF, Wi-Fi, and a then rapidly increasing amount of so-called smart meters. But I can assure you that they are anything but smart. We live in a time when the global elite have increased their control over society and all of us in a broad diversity of ways. But with a focus here this morning on cell towers and my limited time, I will only comment on this. The proliferation of powerful cell towers is very dangerous. The wireless industry is now beginning to deploy their so-called Generation 5 or 5G towers. This is beyond insane and cruel to all living things, from the animals, the trees, the plants, those that fly and swim, and not to be missed, but indeed us humans. We must not allow this. Research scientists have determined that the effects of exposure to EMF are cumulative. We need to stand up like one of the communities in Marin County recently did and in upscale communities in Florida and outlawed the installation of any 5G networks in their community. We cannot expect or hope that the federal agencies like the FCC will protect us. Like virtually all federal agencies, this is an industry controlled network of the global elite. Like myself, community members who live in or visit the vendors in the SoCal Village will not agree to any installation of a new cell tower in the village. And it should be understood there are five schools within the affected zone of this proposed cellular installation. You members of the board should know that we will not agree to you not taking strong action and request your strong support of U.S. Congressional Resolution 530. Thank you, and thank you, John. My name is Sarah Nelson. I'm with the Romero Institute, a law and policy center here in Santa Cruz. I just want to express appreciation for thousands of other citizens that I know agree with what I'm about to say. To you, uh, Bruce McPherson, for your incredible leadership in Monterey Bay Community Power, which means that now we, when we turn on our lights in our three counties, we are not in any major way contributing to global warming. And I want to thank John and Ryan because you are providing the leadership we need on climate. The world is desperate for good leadership on climate. And I want to see it come out of Santa Cruz and then out of California and then into the nation and the world. And we can do it. And I can't even tell you how happy I was when I saw this was on your agenda. And you're going to do it. And we're all behind you. And let's put something fabulous together to, to be a, a model for other counties in our state. We are with you. Thank you so much. This will be our final speaker. Marilyn Garrett, part of wireless radiation alert network, and you have been alerted and informed and provided data <coughs> Over, I've been coming here 18 years since I retired from teaching about the hazards of wireless microwave radiation, the harm to the bees, the harm to all wildlife and us. So you know, you're not uninformed. 
and um, the previous speaker here talking, and thank all the previous speakers who came. Um, the carbon footprint, uh, uh, it's not just the cars and the oil industry, yeah, but that's huge. But the telecom industry also has a huge carbon footprint that doesn't seem to be taken into account here. Regarding the five, thank you for supporting Anna Eshoo's bill. I don't think it goes far enough either. We really need to put a halt to this and remove the harm. When you know something is dangerous, we need to stop it and instead, you are, uh, while you support this bill against 5G, the 5G, the 4G, which is all over the county, and there are 13 of these cell sites in the Aptos Freedom Boulevard um, area where I live, and I keep thinking of how Zach Friend, your aide, told me you took a leadership role in promoting this technology. So my whole uh, neighborhood is now more radiated than before. Uh, we need safety, we don't need microwave radiation. It's a big factor in killing the bees as well, and I want this. Uh, Unfortunately, you have censored the public from commenting on the consent agenda items, but I would like this to be entered. Uh, mobile communications cause for the global disappearance of the bees to be entered with item. What item was that on the bee safe? Be safe, remove the pesticides, remove the wireless. On November 30th, we had a presentation here called 5G Microwave Onslaught, what it means to us. It was recorded. Dr. Carl Merritt was the keynote speaker. And 5G, they showed on the polls in a promotional by Verizon. There are the 4G's antennas, and oh, they'll just put their 5G antenna here. Uh, AT&T is already working with the city of Santa Cruz to promote this deadly technology. We need to stop it. You need to stop it. Watch this, please. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Your time's up. Thank you. All right, that concludes public comment. Uh, the board will now take action. Oh, sorry, ma'am, I didn't realize you still wanted to speak. Please. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak with us today about pu on public comment? <clears throat> All right, this will be our final speaker. Hi, thank you. I'm Joanne Walfeld from Scotts Valley, Santa Cruz County. And <clears throat> I wanted to say about regarding the 5G, uh, since it's going to be in the milli millimeter waves continuously, about 24 gigahertz to 100, uh, we know it affects the sweat glands. The sweat glands act like antennas. It affects the eyes, blindness, cataracts, and the military we know uses it to disperse crowds, to burn the skin, and it uses it on its enemy to control brain thoughts. Um, I'm studying it in every direction I can, and there is a um, whistleblower that has come forward, an airport, Empl uh, employee who has cancer, and she said they have been working with these scanners at the airport that are in their millimeter wavelengths. She said she hasn't gone back to work because of the government shutdown, which has actually been a good thing for her. She's trying to recover. She said the employees that are working at this particular airport with these scanners some have already passed away from cancer. Some right now are in stage three and four cancer, which is usually quite terminal. Many have different types of autoimmune. So the millimeter wavelengths are affecting different tissue types, which causes the cells to quickly create new cells, but they're not effective cells in a tissue type. That is kind of a fast definition of autoimmune. Um, she, she says they get to go home and escape the 5G. They work in the 5G millimeter wavelengths on their jobs, and they are still getting cancers. Some have, as I said, passed away and are dealing with terrible autoimmune. If 5G goes, we will not be able to escape this. This is, this is absolutely an apocalypse.
Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. Uh, we're now gonna move to item number six, which is the action on the consent agenda. These are items one through 46, with the exception of 34. Uh, and I'll ask Supervisor Friend if you have any comments or additions. Thank you, Chair. I just have a brief comment on item 22 uh, with Supervisor Leopold. Appreciate his partnership on this, which is to provide a regulatory framework over some of these new shared mobility services that are coming into communities. As you know, uh, the city of Santa Cruz, for example, has uh, jump bikes. A lot of cities throughout the state actually don't have a regulatory framework of how these and other of the uh, types of these shared mobility services can use the right of way. Uh, so we felt it was important to ensure that we take a look at this in advance of them coming, recognizing that they are coming and seeing what is the best use of the county right away and have a regulatory framework for them once they actually enter into our community so we can have a process by which uh, they can exist or not depending upon uh, what we uh, what the board determines is best once we uh, come back with this framework thank you supervisor leopold uh, good morning chair i just have a number of items uh, to comment on on item number 21 which has been talked about here earlier hr 530 you know the uh, the federal government, the legislature, the, in the U.S. Senate tried to take up a bill last year that would take away local control over uh, the siting of cell facilities. Uh, we also saw a bill in the state legislature. This uh, a board uh, opposed both those pieces. Um, the Trump administration, unable to get what they wanted in the legislature, uh, used the Federal Communications Commission to order a set of rules uh, which totally bypasses any, really any local control over uh, land use for these facilities. Uh, I'm appreciative of uh, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo for uh, uh, introducing H.R. 530, and I think it's a part of our longstanding effort to maintain some local control over the wireless uh, facilities. We have very little that we actually have a, a say over. Um, I also want to comment on item number 22. Uh, uh, as my colleague uh, mentioned, we're starting to see these kind of uh, services available. There are some people who want them and there are some people who are concerned about them. We definitely need a regulatory framework to figure out how to, uh, if they're going to be introduced, how they can best be introduced in our community. And I look forward to um, uh, seeing those regulations come back to um, uh, our board. On item number 23, which is the declaration of a climate emergency, uh, this is a response uh, from um, many, many members of the community. Uh, who have expressed themselves in lots of different ways. Uh, they've been strongly supportive of our efforts, whether it be on banning fracking, whether it be on the creation of the Monterey Bay Community Power. Uh, this board has taken lots of actions to reduce our uh, uh, carbon footprint. Um, and we need to, to, to say as loudly as possible that this is a, a serious problem, that we need to be working aggressively uh, to address it. Um, and again, uh, it's trying to move against what the federal uh, goals are, which is not, they're moving in the opposite direction. Uh, we need to be uh, moving forward. On uh, item 29, which is the Mental Health Services Act uh, update, uh, I wanna thank um, our mental health services and HSA uh, for the work they did to, uh, to really respond to community concerns by ensuring that there was meetings that were held throughout the county to listen to people, that, that they were well attended uh, meetings. Uh, I think that this update reflects that community input and I wanna appreciate uh, uh, our department for, uh, for trying so hard to be uh, inclusive and accountable to the community, so thank you. On item number 32, which is the uh, a report on the renovation of the former veterinary uh, building on, on Soquel Avenue. Um, I think that as we bring this back during budget hearings, I just want to say that, that uh, I would like to see the crisis stabilization program or crisis program housed there. That's clearly a need that we have in the community and I, and I think it would be a, a great opportunity to use that facility uh, to help out for a much needed service uh, that we hear about uh, all the time here at the board, and I know I hear from uh, constituents. Uh, lastly, on item number 40, which is uh, accepting special condition on the Rockview Coastal Access Park, I wanna thank uh, Jeff Gaffney and the Parks Department uh, for their work on this, uh, along with County Council. Uh, the idea that uh, uh, 
that homeowners want to repair their seawall, but also uh, uh, provide some mitigation uh, to be able to support the community will allow uh, the, our coastal access to be improved by the creation of the stairs uh, at Rockview uh, Park. Um, I go there all the time. I'm really, uh, I, this is a well-loved spot and the fact that we'll be able to get down uh, to the ocean right from there safely will be, will, is great and I appreciate the partnership between the Coastal Commission, the county, and homeowners to, to help enhance uh, coastal access. So thank you for your work. And that's it. All right, Supervisor Caput. Uh, the only th uh, thing I'll comment on is uh, item 36 because <coughs> Marilyn Garrett brought it up about the bees and uh, she did mention, uh, uh, you know, the oil industry, of course, and then wireless and the effects. And item 36 <clears throat> actually is gonna address uh, the pesticides uh, that are being used and how that all affects uh, uh, the, the loss of uh, a lot of bees that are very important to agriculture for pollen and pollinization. And uh, so anyway, w uh, my last understanding is that the bee population in Santa Cruz County is doing better now than it was a couple of years ago. So we're doing something right. And so it's good to see some money going into looking at the relationship between all of these different things that are going on and how it affects uh, the bees and how that will affect agriculture in general. Thank you. All right, perfect. Um, and I just have a couple comments to make. Uh, first on item number 22, uh, which is uh, the shared mobility uh, uh, issue, I wanna thank my colleagues for bringing this forward and also just encourage that uh, to the extent possible we need to integrate with the adjacent cities um, because we're a small county geographically and many people don't know uh, when they're leaving the cities versus the unincorporated areas and we wanna have something that works seamlessly allowing people to move across the county. Um, on item number 23, which is a climate emergency, I just wanna thank the community for pushing this and bringing this forward. Uh, it's clear that at least in the United States, we will not have uh, leadership at the federal level. Um, I think we can have leadership at the state and federal level, but most importantly, we have leadership at the community level where people are organizing uh, and making sure that uh, we're taking a stand uh, that is uh, responsible, not only environmentally, but ethically for future generations. And then finally on item number 31, which is a report back on hopes. Uh, I think this was a great initial report back. I wanna really stay focused on the fact that this program was created uh, to address public safety and community impacts first and foremost. And so getting the indicators up and going, especially uh, arrest six months before and six months after as soon as possible so we can track the community impacts uh, is essential in evaluating this program. And so making sure uh, that that's a priority priority as the HOPES program continues to do its good work uh, in the community. So with that, I will take a motion. Uh, the consent agenda today is items 11 to 46, with the exception of item number 34, which was deleted. I would move the consent agenda. Motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we are now moving on to our regular agenda. Uh, the first item up is item number seven. This is a public hearing to consider a resolution amending the unified fee schedule to reduce the fee for year round special event organizer from $380 to $190 for events concurrent with the certified farmers markets as outlined in the memo uh, of the director of health services. And uh, I'll first ask if any of my colleagues have any questions about this item. The only thing I would mention is uh, we're actually talking about reducing something. I haven't heard that from government in a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and uh, I will ask if there are any comments from members of the public. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Nash Dillon, Executive Director, Santa Cruz Community Farmers Market. Um, on behalf of uh, SCCFM, the organization that runs the R5 Farmers Markets here in the county, 
and I'm also speaking on behalf of Catherine Barr, who's the Executive Director of Monterey Bay Certified Farmers Market. Uh, we support this amendment uh, to the year-round special event organizing permit, reducing the fee from $380 to $190. Our organizations operate the lion's share of all farmers markets in the Monterey Bay, operating a total of nine markets. Considering certified farmers markets already are required to purchase an operation permit, uh, which uh, each site is required at a cost of $380, the reduction in this new permit makes perfect sense. Uh, we want to thank the Board of Supervisors, especially Supervisor Courtney's office and Santa Cruz County Environmental Health Department on working on this. Um, we recognize, we hope, we, we're glad that you guys recognize the importance of farmers markets as a promoter and delivery platform for locally grown food, an incubator for new food businesses, and a vital community experience, bringing neighbors, friends, and visitors together every week, year-round, rain or shine. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? That concludes public comment. Uh, and I'll bring it back to the board for action. Move, move the recommended action and just say that less is better sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Motion by McPherson. Second. And Second by I, I would just add, it's important to support uh, our, our community farmers markets. Uh, they not only uh, provide uh, great organic produce and, and help us uh, eat well, but they're also a, a, an important part of our community, and they build community. So thank you for your work, and glad that we're able to support it this way. Thank you. So we have a motion, and we have a second. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. Moving on to item number eight. So this is to consider an ordinance repealing chapters 2.28, 2.30, and 4.09, and sections 4.0. 4.0.090, 4.26.160, and 4.26.170 4 of the Santa Cruz County Code, and amending chapters 2.14, 2.66, 2.82, 4.04, 4.08, 4.22, 4.26, 5.08, 5.16, 5.20, 5.24, 5.26, 5 and 5.46 of the Santa Cruz County Code to correct typographical errors, address organizational issues, align the code with changes to state law, delete unnecessary material, and make any make additional miscellaneous changes as outlined in the memorandum of the county council. This is about our, this is in short, uh, to explain all those numbers, uh, is an ongoing effort by our county council to clean up our code and make sure that it's consistent uh, with relevant laws and uh, clear for, for future boards and uh, members of the public. So we have Jason Heath here to uh, answer any questions the board might have. Well, I thought it was a hazing ritual for the new chair to have to read all those <laughs> yeah. numbers. I was going to say, say that real time. So uh, that was uh, very good. You get to serve the rest of the year. Say it quick three times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Jason Heath for County Council's office, and I'm back. This is the fifth time, the fifth ordinance we're bringing uh, to update the county code provisions. This time we're asking, uh, we're recommending that you repeal a couple of county code provisions that are just um, outdated, no longer needed. For instance, 1989 earthquake relief that's been on the books for a long time and not necessary anymore. A couple others regarding Juvenile Hall. Uh, there's a couple other programs that um, have been changed over time that are no longer necessary, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Do we have any questions? No, it continues to be in a very interesting read, actually, to, to go through our county code this way. Uh, you do, you're doing a lot more work th than we are reading the, these updated codes, but it's helpful for me. Great. Thank you. Any comments from members of the public? I would like to see some elaboration for the public and explanation because this has been going on for many board meetings, so these are sweeping changes. One change that I know has been pushed through by the County Council is the procedures of the board meeting where the comments on the consent agenda item can no longer be brought up by a member of the public. Ms. Garrett? That's actually not this agenda item that we're talking well, about. So you need to talk I'm, about any of the any well, of the many Well, I'd ish like you to areas. elaborate so the public knows what you're talking about. This is on TV. It's all these numbers. I know what happened with that is that the public has been censored, especially as women who speak out been censored by you men. Um, so. Um, I would like some more elaboration on specifics of all these countless numbers. I can't believe there are that many typographical errors in the county code. Thank you. 
Thank you, that concludes public comment and I'll bring it back to the board uh, for action. Uh, Chair, uh, I will move the recommendations and I'll just add that th these aren't all typographical areas, they, they uh, also uh, slight changes in the code references and just to review to make sure that these are still applicable as the, as the attorney uh, mentioned, we had something in our code relating to the 1989 earthquake and 30 years later we don't need that anymore in our code. So these are, these are relatively small changes um, and I appreciate the work that's gone into it. So we have a motion by Leopold, second, second by Friend. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you for your good work. Thank you. Uh, we're moving on to item number nine, which is to consider a final appointment of Steve, o Steve Otten to the Resource Conservation District Board of Directors as an at-large representative for a term to expire November 25th, 2020. Any questions to the board? I move approval. Well, f let me just ask anyone from the public want to comment? Close public comment. I move approval. Okay, we got a motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Our last uh, item of the day is a 10.30 scheduled item, uh, and so the board uh, will recess until 10.30 uh, for consideration of item number 10.
call the meeting uh, back to order. Our first, I our first and only item today is a 1030 scheduled item, which is a public hearing to consider application number 181094, Habitat for Humanity, a subdivision planned unit development for the residential, uh, for a residential development permit for an 11 affordable unit housing project at 2340 Harper Street. And also to accept the determination that the project is exempt in accordance with the California Environmental Quality Act and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. And uh, we have Lizanne from the planning department here to make a presentation. Yes, good morning everybody. So, um, there we go. <laughs> So this subject property is located on the south side of Harper Street. It's in the Live Oak planning area, approximately halfway between the intersection with Chanticleer Avenue and the point where Harper Street dead ends at, uh, I believe, Rodeo Creek Gulch. The parcel is currently developed with a small single family dwelling and some associated sheds. The remainder of the northern portion of the site is open grassland with a few small trees which are mostly around the existing house and the southern third of the parcel slopes down to an ephemeral drainage channel that runs along the, su the southern property line. <coughs> uh, this southern area contains a riparian corridor and an associated buffer zone, which is characterized by eucalyptus and oak woodland with understory vegetation that increases in density as it gets closer to the creek. Along the front of the parcel, and you can kind of see that in the top right-hand picture there, um, there is a line of mature Monterey cypress trees along Harper Street. The property is bounded to the north, east, and west by residential neighborhoods uh, that are zoned for single family development. Although there are some larger legacy parcels that are currently with only one single family dwelling, many of the original parcels have been subdivided and are developed with single family and townhome dwellings on smaller parcels. Um, I would add that um, some of those developments actually are of a greater density than the proposed project. Um, south of the subject site, across the other side of the riparian corridor, uh, is developed with a historic farmhouse and other associated structures, but beyond this, there's a mobile home park. Um, to the west of the project site on Chanticleer Avenue and Capitola Road, about 700 feet northwest of the project site, there's the Live Oak Elementary School. The application is a proposal to divide the existing 69,367 square foot parcel into 11 residential parcels and a common area parcel, and to construct four two-story structures, each containing two single-family dwellings, and one two-story, and two, sorry, two one-story structures, one with um, a semi-detached single-family dwelling unit and one containing one single dwelling unit. Uh, the 11 units will be set within a landscaped private common area that includes a shared parking lot, which is accessed by a central driveway, a communal recreation area and gathering place with a children's playground. There's a fenced community garden with raised planting areas and open space. And um, there's the riparian corridor that runs along the southern portion of the parcel, which will be protected and enhanced. Because 100% of the 11 proposed single family dwellings would be deed restricted as affordable to low or very low income households, the applicant has requested a residential affordable density bonus, which is in conformance with the state density bonus regulations. Under the density bonus law, a maximum bonus of up to 35% may be applied, which would allow for the construction of a total of 17 units. Um, I think actually the density bonus now allows for up to 50%, and I haven't calculated the, the number of units that could be proposed under that, but um, under 35% it would be 17 units, but the applicant is proposing to build only one additional unit over the maximum of 10 units that could be built under standard county regulations and doesn't intend to construct any of the six additional bonus units that would otherwise be allowed. The subject property is zoned R16D, a single family designation that allows residential units <coughs> at a density of 6,000 square feet per unit which is consistent with the urban low density general plan designation. The proposed subdivision is consistent with the zoning and the general plan as allowed under density bonus law. The D designation denotes a designated park site combining district. However, because your board previously determined that development of the parcel for a park 
or other recreational use was not appropriate and that the site should instead be developed for affordable housing, the proposed project is subject only to the regulations of the basic residential zone district. The proposed land division is shown on the tentative map would result in the creation of 11 townhouse style single family parcels and one common area parcel. In addition, there's a 600 square foot, four foot wide strip of land along Harper Street, which will be dedicated to the County of Santa Cruz for street and sidewalk purposes. This project is proposed as a common interest development and the average parcel area per residential unit, which includes the common area, would be 5,610 square feet of net developable land per dwelling, which is consistent with the urban low density residential general plan designation as set out in density bonus law. And that would allow for one unit um, at, a, at the maximum density, would allow for one unit for each 4,080 square feet if the maximum density was um, of 35% was applied. Individual lots within the development as shown on the tentative map range from about 1,241 square feet to 2,474 square feet in area and the common area parcel would contain 49,878 square feet. All of the required external site setbacks for the R16 zone district as applied to the existing parcel have been maintained or they are exceeded. Um, setbacks to new interior property lines, that, that is those between the individual new lots, um, have been reduced in accordance with county code, which allows for interior setbacks to be reduced for parcels that don't abut the periphery of the project site. This reduction of interior setbacks has been proposed to allow for the construction of semi-detached single family dwelling units. The proposed development would also comply with all of the other site and development standards for the R16 zone district, including lot coverage, floor area ratio, and height. While semi-detached dwellings are considered to be a single family use in county code, the semi-detached configuration isn't specifically allowed in the R16 zone district as it would otherwise be in the R13.5 and R14 zone districts. Therefore, the proposed project includes a request for a planned unit development um, or PUD to allow for departure from strict conformance with county code. There are no departures from the otherwise required site and design standards found in the design review ordinance, uh, county code chapter 1311. The proposed PUD <coughs> includes standards specifically designed to mitigate the impact of the proposed development, as well as to provide benefits to the neighborhood and community in which it's located. These benefits include the provision of affordable housing, enhanced resource, resource protection, design excellence, and public viewshed preservation. The residential development along this section of Harper Street is comprised of a mixture of mostly detached <coughs> single family homes that range in size from about 800 square feet, <coughs> excuse me, to over 2,600 square feet in size. There are also townhomes and semi-detached single family homes, which are similar in character to the proposed project. To ensure the proposed development would be compatible with the neighborhood character on Harper Street, the proposed project has been required to include homes that would front onto the street rather than onto the interior driveway. Units along the northern edge of the proposed development have therefore been required to include a front entrance with a gabled porch that opens towards Harper Street. At the lower floor, the homes fronting the street would be set back from the existing edge of Harper Street by a minimum of 38 feet. That's 24 feet from the edge of the proposed right-of-way dedication. And the second story would be set back an additional seven feet. These increased setbacks together with the proposed landscaping and the retention of the existing mature cypress trees will mean that the proposed homes at the front of the parcel will not be visually prominent in any views along Harper Street. The remaining homes are located beyond the shared parking area, approximately 150 feet from Harper Street. These homes front onto a shared landscape recreation area that will include a children's play structure and a communal meeting space with barbecue grills and picnic tables. South of the recreation area, there would be a community garden with raised planting beds that would be allocated to homeowners for growing vegetables or other gardening projects. Individual dwellings have been grouped together to reduce the total number of proposed buildings, which will lessen the visual impact of the development and also reduce the overall coverage by impervious surfaces. The proposed semi-detached single family dwellings will not result in massive buildings that will be out of character with the surrounding homes. 
the maximum floor area proposed for any one of the proposed buildings which contain two homes would be 2,520 square feet, which is similar in size, in fact, slightly smaller than uh, existing homes along uh, Harper Street, the newer homes. The maximum height of the proposed two-story structures measured from existing grade would not exceed 24 feet, which is less than the maximum 28 feet allowed in the zone district. And therefore, the visual impact of the development will be roughly equivalent to a single-family home development containing six moderately sized detached single-family homes. <coughs> So as directed, all of these structures would be required to be enforceably restricted to be maintained as single family dwellings such that no portion of any home may be converted to an ADU. To protect the existing public view sheds and to maintain the character of the neighborhood as far as possible, the site has been designed and laid out to retain open vistas through the site from Harper Street to the wooded arroyo along the southern boundary. To reduce the total number of structures, 11 single family homes are accommodated in just six structures, and these are laid out either side of an open area running on a north-south axis through the center of the parcel. The open area will be comprised of the access driveway, um, parking area, a landscaped recreation area, and the community garden beyond. And so the, the layout basically allows views across the parcel to the woodland beyond. Uh, there's a new sidewalk that's proposed along the project frontage, and it'll run along the southern side of the, away from the road of the existing cypress trees, which will allow for pedestrian connectivity along the street while preserving the existing character along the project frontage. Um, this this isn't um, something that came up with the planning commission, but they wanted to know that uh, garden sheds that uh, would be potentially developed in association with the community garden wouldn't block that view. So um, the PUD includes language that would restrict sheds to be within these two areas shown on the plan here in red, e either side of the common area so that they wouldn't be in public view. Uh, the buildings have all been designed to feature clean lines and simple shapes, which is consistent with many of the other older homes in the neighborhood. And all of them include features such as gable roofs and painted wood effects siding and covered porches. Although each of those buildings would have a similar aesthetic, the color palette will be different for each structure, and the colors have all been designed with uh, muted earth tones, grays, greens, browns, to blend with the existing homes on Harper Street and with the natural environment. The proposed architectural features and variety of colors will break up the visual bulk and mass of the proposed development. Extensive landscaping is also proposed throughout the development, together with uh, retaining those existing cypress trees, um, which will further screen and soften the homes to enhance privacy and create a more intimate development. Um, no development or site disturbance is proposed in the riparian corridor or the associated riparian buffer zone, except for the terminus of the storm drain system for the project and associated energy dissipator. There was a biotic report that was submitted in support of the proposed project, and this concluded that there would not be any significant impacts on the riparian corridor. Uh, further, to ensure the proposed project ensures enhanced resource protection, a habitat restoration plan is proposed that will require a prohibition on public use of the oak, uh, eucalyptus oak woodland uh, and uh, preserve the understory and avoid impacts to the resident wildlife. And in addition, there'll be um, some removal of select eucalyptus trees and replanting of native oaks and other shrub species to help enhance that habitat. All of those recommendations of the biotic report have been incorporated into the project and also included as conditions of approval. The parking for the development will be provided in a shared parking lot which is located behind the proposed homes that front onto Hump Harbor Street. The proposed parking area includes a total of 30 parking spaces which will provide two spaces for each of the 11 units in accordance with the parking requirements for a density bonus project and will also provide eight spaces which are not required by code for guest parking. It should also be noted that although the applicant did request these of reduced parking standards consistent with density bonus law, that the project as proposed also fully complies with the residential parking standards set out in the residential parking standards ordinance, which is county code section 1310-552. Uh, traffic impacts from the proposed projects um, based on a traffic analysis prepared by um, Keith Higgins, traffic engineer, 
um, have shown that the traffic impacts, impacts are expected to be insignificant. So therefore, in conclusion, um, as proposed in condition, the project is consistent with the applicable policies and codes of the uh, ordinance and general plan, and staff is recommending that uh, your board certify that the project is exempt from further environmental review under the California Environmental Quality Act guidelines set forth in Article 12.5, Sections 15192 and 15194. Uh, adopt an ordinance granting a planned unit development as allowed by the Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 1810 relating to the establishment of development standards for APN 02917105 and approve application number 181094 based on the findings and conditions set out in the staff report to the Planning Commission of December 12, 2018. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Now I'm going to offer uh, board members a chance to ask any questions of Ms. Jeffs. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, could you just uh, review the specific exceptions or variances they're requesting uh, under the affordable housing laws? Um, they, the, this, your, uh, the request on the density bonus. So at the time that the application came in under state density bonus law in chapter 17, or chap 17 um, of the county code, they would be allowed, because they're doing a 100% affordable project, to have um, up to a 35% additional density. Um, that is based upon the gross parcel size. It does not, uh, as set out in state law, require that um, riparian corridors are deducted. And um, all of the figures that result from that are rounded up. So doing the mathematics and that is set out in the staff report, it would lead to a maximum density of 17 units on the site. So th th that's the only variance that, th that is, is being requested? The, uh, the only other change that's been requested from county code is that um, we're doing the, the PUD has been requested to allow for the semi-detached structures in the R16 zone district because it's only per code allowed in the R13.5 and R14 zone district. Um, they did also request the reduced parking standards that are allowed in um, chapter 17, but um, even though they've requested that and it, meet, it ex well exceeds the standards based on that requirement, they also do meet the standards in our regular parking ordinance. I checked that as well. Um, and they had asked for uh, originally more units, but there were limitations because of the riparian corridor, is that correct? That's correct. The original application came in with 12 units. Thank you. Any other questions? <coughs> if you could tell me, uh I know it's in here, but uh, uh, the square footage of the whole development, uh, the lot, uh, is it, how, is it an, how the, many acres? The structures or the parcels? The parcels. The parcels. Let me find those figures for you. So, um, let's see. I, I don't have each lot broken out. They, each of this, the, the actual housing lots, they range from 1,241 square feet um, to 2,474 square feet, and there are some that are in the middle. The one that's 2,474 square feet is the one that you see here. This is the, the um, single level, um, single family dwelling. This one is not a, a semi-detached structure. That has the larger lot. The smaller lots are ones like this one um, there. And the, the community, um, there's a community room? There is not a community room. There is the community open space. The open and space. Um, that, that includes all of the driveway, the parking area, the community garden, and the open space. That parcel um, is about 49,878 square feet. That does not include the 600 square foot dedication parcel where the sidewalk will be along the frontage. Okay, and the size of the lot, uh, uh, the rough total, estimate The original on, parcel? Uh, uh, acreage. I have that figure. Hold Is it moment. about two, three? 69,000 something. Um, of course, it's not jumping out at me, I apologize. As I remember, it's about an acre and a half. Yes, about an acre yes. And a half. I, I did have the figure in square feet here in my presentation, but I guess. Okay. 
Okay. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, uh, let's open it up for public comment. Can I please have a show of hands for how many people wish to speak today? Can we get the fire chief up first? Can we get the fire chief up first? Can we get the fire chief up first? Oh. Um, so, uh, seeing, let's, let's give two minutes, and I, I would ask everyone who wants to speak today to please, uh, if, you're, if you're able, please line up so that we can keep people uh, coming. So uh, first, I'm sorry, one second here. Uh, before we begin, the applicant, if the applicant is in the room, uh, I'd ask them if they want to speak. Uh, and then also uh, the central fire chief can come up. Good morning. I, I'm going to cut my uh, talk short because um, Lizanne covered everything that, that I was going to say, but um, my name is David Foster, Executive Director with Habitat for Humanity. Um, we're currently celebrating our 30th anniversary serving Santa Cruz and Monterey County area. We're now, uh, we've now completed 52 homes over the years and we promote the idea of home ownership that's also tied to permanent affordability. We believe that home ownership builds towards stability uh, for the families that we serve and stability for the neighborhoods where we build. Out of all of the homes that we've built over the years, we've never had a foreclosure and only six families have ever moved from their homes. Um, from their homes. We're currently finalizing construction on the fifth home on our Los Esteros Court project in Live Oak on land that was provided by the county and we're currently taking applications. I hope this is visual or on TV. We're taking applications for families interested in the two homes that are being constructed now, the last two homes on that property um, now and in the springtime. One home is being designed for a fully wheelchair accessible uh, unit and we'll be looking for an applicant family that has a permanent mobility disability and the last home will be built starting in the spring and will be designed for a veteran family. Um, so as you know, Habitat builds differently than other developers. We build with the participation of the community with over 80% of the labor provided by volunteers and by the home, home buyer families themselves. We're proposing to build the project in three phases. The first phase will include the bulk of the site grading and compaction work on the site and the construction of the first four homes. These will be the, du the two duplexes that will front on Harper Street, screened by the Monterey Cypress trees that are there. The second phase will include the next four homes and the final phase will complete the last three homes. This has been a lengthy uh, pre-development period and I think that uh, we've tried to be very responsive to both the concerns and issues brought by the neighbors and by the planning staff. No housing development is easy and when you add permanent affordability into the mix, everything seems to get more difficult. I'd like to thank our planning staff, especially Lizanne Jeffs, um, Suzanne Ise, and Julie Conway, who've helped guide us through the process to this point. Our project architect, Bill Kempf, and our civil engi engineer, Joel Rika, uh, Joel Rika from Bowman and Williams, are both here if you have any technical questions for them. Um, so we're, um, we're excited about the project. We've put a lot of effort into it. And uh, I think uh, we've followed very carefully the guiding principles that the Board of Supervisors set out for this project back in May of uh, 2017 when we were first selected as the, um, of the preferred developer for this project. So thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, we're just gonna hear from the fire chief. Thank you, Chair, members of the board. My name is Stephen Hall, fire chief for the Central Fire District of Santa Cruz County. First, I'd like to say that I am not opposed to any development coming into Santa Cruz County that, that brings in affordable housing, and I'm not opposed to this project either. 
these plans were approved by our contract plan uh, check company uh, for meeting the fire code, the international fire code, and uh, they do in fact meet the code as presented. I was approached Friday in regard to concerns regarding access and egress from this particular development. Uh, I had an opportunity to drive the project this weekend or drive on Harper and, and see the project site. Um, I do have a couple of concerns in regard to access and egress of our fire apparatus. Uh, but moving forward, I, I, I don't think that that would be a, a huge concern in making sure this project is done right and working with the planning staff and the developer that I have yet to meet, and I, that's, that's my fault. Um, but I think that uh, by working on these issues or, or these concerns, uh, it, again, we wanna make the project right uh, just like you do. Um, so I look forward to uh, working with the planning department and the developer to see if we can um, and get these into into the plan. Be happy to answer any questions if you have any for me. I just have a question for Ms. Jeffs, which is: Is there, assuming that this project gets approved, um, would there be a is there a mechanism by which the planning staff can meet with the fire chief to walk through ingress and egress issues uh, and make adjustments as needed? Yes, absolutely. The next phase of this project would be that we need to um, is the recordation of the map. The developer will be submitting improvement plans, which are the technical engineered plans, to um, the county surveyor. Uh, the county surveyor will actually be the lead agency on that. Um, but plans will um, come out. And I would, I think that before we get to that stage, we can require a meeting with the fire chief, with public works, um, and I would definitely be part of that meeting to facilitate any minor changes to the plans that would address the concerns. And we can make that a condition of approval um, prior to recordation of the map, prior to the improvement plans being approved by everybody before Great. they are even submitted. Great, thank you. That worked uh, for you, Chief? That works for me. Let Great. me just ask, uh, uh, so you feel like this could be resolved as part of this process, you don't need a delay? Uh, I think we can resolve the concerns uh, without delaying the project. Um, I think there's enough time between the uh, decision made by the board and the improvement plans being submitted that, uh, that we can work with both planning and the developer. Great, thank you. All right, now we can have public comment. Thank you everybody for your patience. Uh, thank you, Buck Martone, Harbor Street resident. Since the beginning of this process, the Harbor Street community has not been against this project. What we have problems with is the process. Let me give you a few examples. We were here in November for the Planning Commission meeting. There was a motion on the floor pretty quick to pass this without even having to set a plans in front of them. I think that's wrong. Secondly, there were no negative declarations from the fire department's issue and the traffic engineer's issue. So I went to the fire department, I asked the fire marshal what happened, Chief Hall just summarized it. I went to the traffic engineer, I made a phone call to the guy, nice man. I said, w how did you come up with these numbers? Ninth, ninth edition, 2012 edition of the traffic engineer study. There's a matrix in there. They said, did, were you given any instructions? Do you understand it's a, it's a dead end street? Is there a factor you use for that? He goes, we were not given those specifics when we were given this project. This is from Mr. Higgins. I'm not making this up. He, he drew this, he wrote, wrote this plan up based on what came out of a book not the actual conditions on Harper Street, and that was accepted by the planning department here and then entered into a public record. I find that highly offensive and wrong to the neighbors on Harper Street who've been talking about public safety and traffic issues from day one. That's my comment. Uh, Pete Peterson, I live on Chanticleer, right around the corner from Harper Street. I've been there since 1979. As you'll hear from people coming behind me and Buck just now, the problems that would happen with mandatory evacuations right now would be gridlock on that address at the, on that at this location. This project started out as a as a park. Everybody was for the park. Now, 
We have these buildings happening here, which everyone here is for and behind Habitat for Humanity. But what we're not for is the impact on the neighborhood if in the future a calamity were to occur that occur that required mandatory evacuations. And this county, with it, in March, I understand, we are not going to, you're not be allowed to have on a dead end street this type of project which is now, here we are on a dead-end street that dead-ends into a private dead-end street with no egress to Capitola Road. Uh, you can only imagine the chaos that gridlock would happen and then the liability that this county could possibly face for pr approving this when in March you've already said we're not going to do these anymore on dead-end streets. Good morning, well, a little bit. Um, Reverend James Lapp, pastor at St. Stephen's Lutheran Church in Live Oak, very close to this uh, development, and a founding member of COPA in 2003, an organization of 18 faith communities and nonprofits in Santa Cruz County. And we have uh, several uh, COPA leaders here today. I'd like to invite them to stand. And we're all here today, and I'm the spokesperson. So in, in light of that, I'd like to request one additional minute, since none of those people are going to be coming up forward. Sir, I can't, I can't do that. Uh, everyone gets the same amount of time. If people want to line up and make your point, that's fine, too. I I'd like to thank to. Supervisors Leopold and Friend for attending our uh, COPA convention this past September, where we gathered over 600 people and community leaders to help set our agenda to make our communities better places to live. Year after year, as we gather and tell stories, the number one thing we hear is affordable housing throughout this county. And uh, we have skin in the game. Our congregation recently uh, had its property used for affordable housing, 40 unit development that recently opened. And so I'm here representing COPA institutions who understand the bigger picture in our communities. And I am asking you to not reduce the number of units for the Harper Street project any further. As supervisors, I think you're tasked with keeping the bigger picture in mind while working with local neighbors. And this, uh, this project, um, so many reductions have, have already been made from what was possible that um, six families that could have been housed here uh, will no longer be able to do that. Families like 60% of the Watsonville Police Department staff that are living elsewhere in other counties. Families like the young woman from our congregation who worked as a Safeway cashier and her husband a mechanic and were forced out of their house and lived in a trailer in our church parking lot for three months with their small children. So I urge you to approve this project as is and please don't reduce it any further. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dean Lundholm, a COPA leader. And in COPA, as you know, we tell stories to find out what's going on in, in the community. And I heard one on Saturday, a family of five, two adults, three children living in one room with no kitchen pri privileges and no bathroom privileges. And so when we consider these projects, um, I think it's very important that we do not reduce them from the maximum possible under the zoning and the constraints. Otherwise, we're depriving people who, uh, of homes and people who are necessary for our community um, a, a place to live. You know, what kind of community do we have? And what kind of community do we want? Good morning, my name is Nancy Abbey. I am no longer a resident of Santa Cruz County, but I wanted to speak today to say the same thing I said when I was a resident. I have no personal stake in this issue. I lived on Chanticleer, but on the other side of Capitola Road, I would not be impacted in any way by what happens on Harper Street. And I think it's really important for you to hear from somebody with no stake. I have also been, as most of you know, a really strong advocate for affordable housing. I was one of the co-founders of Affordable Housing Now. And I have to speak out against this because knowing that street, 
that narrow, barely two-way, dead end, no sidewalk street with lots of kids, I just, I don't think it's appropriate there. And I also know that a lot of the parents of children at Live Oak School go down to the end of Harper and wait for their kids there. So there are even more kids added to the population. I absolutely support Habitat. I love their pictures and what they want to do. So uh, David, I think, is one of my heroes. But I just think we need to find another place not on a dead end street with no sidewalks and barely enough room for two cars to pass each other. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kathy Kress. I live on Chanticleer, two doors down from Harper, and I've lived there for 30, 31 years. I think what you're talking about here are two larger pictures. One larger picture certainly is statewide and maybe nationally, and certainly in this county, there is a huge need for affordable housing. I understand this. I have been a social worker for 40 years. The second larger picture is that those people who need affordable housing need to be safe. And safety is a big issue in this for me, and you've heard many people, and you are going to hear many people who talk about this. First of all, it is what everybody's saying. It's a dead end street, it has no sidewalks, and it has no way out. So what you have there is because of fire, or any kind of catastrophe, people who, you know, need housing being an inferno, <laughs> possibly. I mean, look at all the environmental fires that have happened all over the country, and it's certainly all over California. The second thing is um, I came to the Planning Board Commission, and one person on the board voted no, and she said what Buck, um, you know, also all, already talked about is that the county, as you well know, is considering limiting development on dead end streets. And you're way ahead of the game as far as I can saw, uh, see. And I see litigation on the uh, frontier of the county because making this go through is not only putting everybody in jeopardy. I am not saying reduce this. I, excuse me, I'm not saying get it, get rid of it. I think that it can be done. I think it needs to be further reduced and it, you need to table it as far as I'm concerned and uh, look at the safety issues. Thank you. Good morning, board. Uh, Casey Byer from the Santa Cruz Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, um, we're celebrating our 130th anniversary this year, so we've been around this county for a long, long time. And I want to compliment the Habitat for Humanity in their 30th year. Uh, they are a community partner that works real hard to develop affordable housing for our people in our community. When I uh, survey our members every year, two issues come to, the, come to the top, housing and transportation. And I think your planning department can work out any of the concessions that are regarding the public safety concerns that you're going to hear previously and will hear after I speak. Uh, do the right thing. A approve this project. And if you don't, the state uh, will create uh, incentives to make you do something that you don't want to do and that way give away gas tax measures. So this is a really important opportunity. Uh, and if there's planning concessions on this particular parcel, those can be worked out. Thank you. My name is Greg Grouse and I live on Willow Court across from the proposed development. I'm also the author of the CARE 2 petition that states that the affordable housing development is too large for this neighborhood and that at its current size it is unsafe for the current neighbors as well as new neighbors. Each of you should have received a link to this uh, report. The petition has received 23,000 signatures nationwide and 145 signatures locally. The local signatures are certainly the most relevant here. However, I suggest that 23,000 signatures shows that there's broad objection to two large developments in neighborhoods 
and further validation of our concern for a safe neighborhood. I'll read a couple of the comments made by local uh, signatures. I am a big supporter of Habitat for Humanity and over the years have spent volunteer time and money. That said, this street is incredibly narrow and I don't see a situation where there will be enough parking in the development and certainly not on the street for the number of units. Habitat for Humanity, a second comment, Habitat for Humanity project currently slated for Harper Street is too big. Our narrow street cannot sustain additional vehicle parking and traffic. Reduce the scale to a reasonable and sustainable level and you will get community support. I ask you to vote against the current proposed development and require a reassessment and require Habitat to provide an appropriately sized and safe proposal. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Marty Cavanaugh and I am a current construction volunteer with Habitat for Humanity and serve as the board of director president at this time. I would like to introduce quickly those board of directors who are here with me today to represent the support of this passage. First, we have Ron Buswell, immediate past president and consummate construction volunteer. We have our board secretary, Jan Tillotson, who has uh, been with the board a number of years, and we have Rick De La Cruz, who is also a board of director. Our interest here today is to make sure that this board understands that the process by which we were selected as an applicant for the project and the uh, work that we put into making sure that every process required by the planning department, your own county pro program, was complied with along the way to, to developing this project completely. We understand what the shortfall is. We understand that we could have had 17 housing projects on this property and we worked with the community to get that down to 11. We added parking. We also are sure that the requirements required by the fire department and the planning commission can be easily mitigated in a future meeting. So we, we really hope that you will pass this project today. Our community people are waiting for this opportunity. Thank you. Hi, I'm Fred Guess. I'm a resident on Harper Street. I live across the street from where the proposed uh, site will be built. And I mainly wanted to talk about the traffic like a lot of people did. Not traffic coming and going, but the fact is it's an unapproved street. Now, it's a great plan but not every artery can, or street can you know, support it. And somebody said barely a two-lane road. It's not barely a two-lane road. At many points, it's a one-lane road. And if an engine comes down and everybody's freaking out and going into pack mode to escape something like a fire, the engine's never gonna make it down or the people are never gonna leave and people panic. They're not gonna make room because there is no room. You can't go to the right or left because it's got trees. So those concerns are real concerns. We're talking about the street feeding into it, real concerns. I did have one like little minute thing that kind of bugs me because I keep hearing this number 17. If they could have built 17, how come when they put in an application for 12, it got kicked back to 11? So where's the BS there? I'm sick of hearing that they could have built 17 because they couldn't even build 12. And they didn't do us because it was a favor to us, they did it because the county kicked it back. Sorry, that's just a pedantic little note. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Chair, Supervisors, um, Matt Huerta, Housing Program Manager with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership in support of this development. Um, it really represents uh, a, a model process, I believe, for getting very challenging housing development done. Um, the era of, of vanilla, easy to do projects is over, it's been over for a long time, so you know, I don't have to tell you twice, this is gonna come up over and over and over again about how do we deal with getting our housing needs met. And we have to take action every chance we get on these uh, opportunities, and so it does represent a compromise 
um, you know, for everybody involved. Um, you know, we're joined by a huge coalition of support that supports this, folks that you've been hearing from over the last few days and weeks uh, through our Action Center, Shadow Brook Restaurant, uh, folks, again, taking individual responsibility for their actions, but affiliated with several folks with um, Shadowbrook Restaurant, Pajaro Valley Shelter Services, Soquel Union Elementary, Eden Housing, the Santa Cruz Business Council, um, Sure Harvest, Bay Federal, Blue Water Construction, many others in the community that are concerned about meeting their, uh, our workforce uh, uh, housing needs, among many others, and there's lots of concerns, legitimate concerns about safety. Um, Certainly we all, all should be focused on that. I believe that uh, you know, Habitat for Humanity and many others are making all the mitigations and necessary improvements there to take all that into account. And also, as you know, you, we all need to take into consideration the public health and safety risk to all of us for not achieving our housing goals. Thank you very much for your leadership. I'm Peter Spicer, and I live at the top of the street, and this is what I see. There is only one entrance and exit to Harper Street at Chanticleer Avenue. Roughly 90 current residences, many with spouses, girlfriends, boyfriends, and renters, most with cars, use this intersection all day long. Parking is allowed on both sides of the street except for a short one-car length red zone on the southeast corner of the intersection. Regular and routine parking results excuse me, results from cars and trucks spilling over from nearby Chanticleer residences and businesses where Chanticleer Avenue has no on-street parking. The park vehicles effectively reduce the street to one lane at the intersection and off and on down the street. 70 to 80 percent of the time, cars entering the street must stop and pull over to allow exiting cars to pass. Additionally, school and daycare traffic parking um, have the following daily schedule, all occurring within the first block of the street. 8.30 elementary school drop off, nine o'clock daycare drop off, 2.30 elementary school pickup, four to five daycare pickup. For an easy exit, I often see parents back their cars out into the intersection. This project adds at least 31 more cars to the current scenario. With spouses, boyfriends, girlfriends, and sublet renters, this can easily increase to 45 to 50 cars. This increase is not imperceptible and not insignificant, which were words that were inappropriately used in the traffic report. On a minor note, a civil engineer from Public Works Transportation here came out, met with me, saw the street and the intersection, looked at some of my traffic photos, and actually came back to put a fresh coat of red paint on that curb right there. It is, astonishing me, it is, it is astonishing to me that as, as our public representatives, you might disregard clearly flawed safety reports and allow additional unsustainable Thank you, impact. Sir. Thank you. Thank Please you, vote against this and reduce it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Tim will be speaking for affordable housing now. And I would just like to point out one thing. Um, these neighbors are concerned about that street and the safety of the street. But you notice in their photograph, their cars parked on both sides of the street. I'm just wondering why they never came to you before this project and said we should have parking on only one side of the street. Their concern about the safety on their street only occurred when this was proposed. So please don't listen to that argument. Uh, it's, uh, this is a very good project, it's well thought out, and it's definitely needed, and it's one of the few public pieces of land left where you can build an affordable housing project that's 100% affordable housing. So you know our mantra, it takes land, money, and political will. You're the political will. Get this passed, thank you. My name is Donna Von Joe Tornell. I live on Willow Court. 
across the street from the proposed development. I have lived in this neighborhood for 35 years. When I moved into my present house, there were empty lots all around, and most houses in Live Oak were on large lots. There were horses on what is now Brazil Lane, and in the area up for this latest attempt at high density development, goats, chickens, rabbits, and even a donkey were part of the neighborhood. It feel, felt like what it was is, which is a rural area in between two cities. Since then, many of the open areas near my house have been developed. We made efforts to keep the density and construction fitting into our neighborhood, but it wasn't, we had mixed success with that. There are issues on a substandard dead end street that are being ignored for this Habitat for Humanity project. I want to emphasize once again my concern for the scale of this development and its implications for neighborhood safety while I understand the need for affordable housing. None of my kids can live here and I'm prepared for this land to be used for this purpose. I strongly believe that this development is too large. Um, adding at least 50 additional residents and their automobiles to a dead end substandard street that varies in width, has only one passable traffic lane, is unsafe. We have demonstrated, and in my personal, um, my house burned, so if, if a fire truck couldn't come through, I only lost the top half, uh, I would have lost the whole house. One of my children on a bicycle was hit by a car at Harper and Chanticleer, so I think there are safety issues, and yes, we did talk about these many, many, many years. Um, secondly, uh, it's a dead end street. Everybody will, we keep saying that. People will have to leave that way and you're just, this is a recipe for disaster. So make this a smaller development. I don't, I know we need more housing, but we need safety. Thank you. Uh, good morning, my name is Holly Tyler. I live at 2226 Harper Street. First of all, I'd like to say that I am a strong supporter of affordable housing. My concern with this project is its scale. Aside from the fact that it is way too large for the character of our street, my specific concern is the traffic that it would be generated. I read the traffic report prepared for Mr. Foster and Habitat by the traffic engineer and found it to be flawed. Here's what I saw. The trip generation data is from 2012. Reality is that each home has more cars per home than it did in 2012. I think we all can uh, agree with that. I've lived on Harper Street now for almost 10 years and I've seen a great uh, increase in the number of cars per home. Number two, the traffic report didn't factor in the narrowness of the street. It's 20 feet wide in many places, especially at 2340 Harper. This is very narrow for a residential street. UC Berkeley's Institute of Urban and Regional Planning conducted a street engineering survey of California cities and counties asking what they're using for their standard and the result was 36 to 40 feet of pavement for residential streets in comparison to the 20 foot wide section in front of the subject property. It doesn't make sense. Also, number three, the traffic engineer didn't factor in the fact that this is a dead end street. How could such an important fact be overlooked? It's a key feature of Harper Street. All of the traffic generated by this project is gonna be going in and out of the Harper Street Chanticleer intersection of which we have a picture right there. It's already greatly Im impacted. This intersection has cars queuing up to enter and exit at busy hours and there are constantly cars jockeying with other cars. Safety is our concern here of, all, of our neighbors, whether it's vehicular traffic, bicycle traffic, and pedestrians. We have many families on the street. We're near an elementary school. Please postpone this project and redo the traffic report. Thank you. Hello uh, and hello again, uh, supervisors and council. Um, I think I'm filming the thing. 
Anyways, a um, lot of good comments by um, all the citizens here. I live on Chanticleer as well. Um, and for those that don't know me, I'm Benjamin Kogan. And um, one of the things that I kind of noticed in the diagram is since they're two-story houses, if a fire truck needed a ladder, it's not really going to be able to make that 90-degree turn to get close to the house. So it may actually pose a problem, uh, just like the Aptos Village planning project is not able to have fire trucks go and get to the house. Also, I noticed uh, the speaker said about ADUs and tiny homes, that that's not uh, something that uh, they want even as a factor. Um, and uh, the other thing is nothing, uh, you know, uh, support Habitat for Humanity and their cause. I'd like to learn more and know. Um, but it seems like it's a... Uh, you know, might be government money or bureaucracy in a way where it's going to that and then they're going to collect rent and that's going to um, put line, the, it won't be part of the local, uh, the local uh, citizenry and the local homeowners. And so that for me kind of takes away the, the strength of Santa Cruz because the more local homeowners we have, the stronger we are. And in terms of affordable housing, uh, affordable housing is always more expensive than what everyone thinks it's going to be. It's going to be over a thousand dollars. People can't afford it. Um, and you know, that's from my experience what affordable housing is. And my suggestion request um, is that we, uh, hold this, listen to the majority of the speakers that are against this, open up for discussion, open up the street maybe to a different part like maybe Capitola and maybe uh, support the landlords in uh, cheaper ways for them to have ADUs. Thank you. My name's Duncan Ballinger. I'm a 35 day, uh, year resident of Willow Court, which is a private street right across from this development. Uh, as for the gentleman that says we haven't tried to do anything about the street before, mm -hmm. we have. We've tried to get sidewalks there forever. Our last major request, as I uh, remember, was with Jam Buttes. We were turned down. So there's an issue with the children on this street going to school. I fear that some kid is going to get killed on that street if we keep doing what we're doing. There needs to be a bigger street there before anything is done. Thank you. As a retired teacher, my name's Marilyn Garrett, I always put the health and safety of children above anything else and work to assure that the situation, the conditions provided for that. You've heard people here talk about the detrimental effects this plan would have, uh, well, well substantiated. The top priority is safety. This does not sound like an appropriate place for this. We all want affordable housing, but this is a structural problem. Even if this goes through, it's a drop in the bucket. And I keep thinking as a teacher of that bumper sticker I had, it will be a great day when the schools have all the money they need and the Air Force has to have a bake sale to be a bomber. And it will be a great day when we can provide for social services and human well-being instead of having over our ta half of our tax dollars siphoned out for military. Uh, another factor here on safety, a key factor, is the proliferation of wireless facilities on all of these streets that are emitting radiation that are documented to cause adverse health effects like increased cancer rates, Maryland, heart you problems, gotta, Maryland, insomnia. Please so stick my to the question, item before us. I, this is a safety issue who wants to have houses by industrial toxic sites. Where are all these sites? This is another factor. I think this is what people People have said here, this is very inappropriate. It's dangerous in terms of fire, safety, school children, traffic. Please vote against it. Good morning, supervisors. Leopold, Cabot, Coonerty, Friend, and McPherson. Thank you for listening to this extremely important matter 
regarding our Harbor Street neighborhood. My name is Karen Mungary. I'm a lifelong resident of Santa Cruz, and I have lived on Creekview Lane for over 34 years. I also support the uh, Housing Authority and the affordable housing. Creekview is at the end of, on the east end of Harper Street. This is a dead end street, as you've all heard. And for the surrounding side streets, uh, because of the narrow, unimproved street, sometimes the one-way traffic is difficult to maneuver. Common sense says this is a real potential danger and accident waiting to happen if this, uh, if this improvement if this is approved now, please give this your most, utmost attention and reassess this project and, and have it done to a smaller scale, making it safer for all of our neighborhood and the current and new neighbors. Thank you. This is my first time to speak, so please, uh, accept my apology as far as my speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, you did great. Hey, Mr. Coonerty. My name's Fred Mahler. I live also on Harper Street. I am past where the development is going to be. And I would say probably somewhere between 20 and 30% of the time that I drive from my house out to get to Chanticleer, which would be the first major intersection, 625 feet past the project, I have to pull over to the side to allow someone else to get through. When I'm coming back home, I have to pull over to the side to let someone come out of three. One out of three times, one out of four times, somewhere in that range. We already have a traffic issue on Harper Street. We already, Mr. Leopold, have a safety issue in your district. And yet here we are, we're saying, hey, just add 30 more spots on the thing and this development. And oh, we sized it down some, so it'll really be just fine. That's, um, if they have 30 parking spots on the thing to try and house the number of cars that they're going to have there, then we're gonna have 30 more cars in ingress and egress daily and daily, twice daily. When you have a former fire guy like Buck talking about, hey, this is an issue, when you have the fire chief saying, well, you know, there's some problems here that need to be addressed that haven't addressed, I kind of feel like the approval process winds up like getting a mortgage in 2006, <laughs> right? No one really got into the practical part of it. If you guys just came over and got on the street and stood there for a half an hour, you'd see the problems. John, you've been there enough. I don't get how you cannot be standing up and saying, wow, this is too much for it. And I get the feeling that you, somewhere we got into the system much like the mortgage system. We're just going to prove it because it is the right thing. Affordable housing is absolutely the right thing. The density, the number of cars on the street, the street can't handle that density. It is a dead end. You guys are starting to address that as a community. When is it that... You, we have that moment where it fails us, and we all look back and go, God, what were we thinking? We're smarter than that. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Hi, I'm Gail Rorvik, and I live on Harper Street. I've been there 35 years and love the street. In fact, that's kind of what I want to talk to you about. Um, the people on Harper Street are the ones who are asking you to put this on hold and take a look at it, and it's because every day we have the impact of what the traffic involved is going to be like and, and the impact of um, this amount, this huge of a project is going to have on our daily lives. A, a daily, um, as we've been talking about, if I want to leave Harper Street, a uh, couple of times I've got to pull to the right while I let somebody go and then I go and then someone over here is pulling over while I go. I mean, this is every time I leave the street and every time I come home. 
And I guess if I was more organized, I'd just do that once a day. But, um, but I hope you see also, these are beautiful buildings. It's a great theory. And the people who are speaking uh, for the project don't live on Harper Street. Come and check it out. Thank you. Hey, my name is Evan Sroki with Santa Cruz DMV. Support the project, and uh, I ride my bike everywhere, so I don't really care about car traffic, and I care more about the housing crisis that's going on. And, uh, you know, people don't live on this street, and they're not concerned about it because well, there's nowhere else to live, you know? I gotta live out in Felton, and I would much rather live, you know, closer to, you know, a major urban area, but it's just too pricey, and you guys don't build enough, and it takes two years to approve a freaking Habitat for Humanity project. So, you know, like, this is where we're at. Like, we need housing, and if you're gonna decide that having housing for cars is more important than housing for people, like, what the heck is that all about? Like. You need to approve this project, and I'm frankly like pretty mad about it that it's not denser. Like we need like denser projects. We don't need like two and a half years of process to just you know get 11 housing units. Like we need like 10, 100 times this much. There's waiting lists in the thousands for like affordable housing. Like this project needs to happen, and it should be denser. Like it sh these projects need to be denser all over like the county. So. Yeah, I think you should approve this and uh, yeah, approve it like today. This needs to happen. All right, <clears throat> that concludes public comment. I'll bring it back to the board for uh, deliberations and a motion. Uh, Supervisor Leopold. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to everyone who uh, uh, spoke today. Uh, I have uh, uh, most everybody in the room I'm friendly with, uh, and there's a lot of causes to support here. Um, when I ran for office in 2008, I walked a lot of blocks. And uh, there were places that I thought I knew in Live Oak, um, and then there were places that I found out about when I, when I did that. And there were some places that I thought I always wanted to live, and after walking the neighborhood, found out that that wasn't really something I was interested in. Um, and it was the first time that I walked on this block of Harper Street. And after walking on the street, it is different than a lot of other blocks in Live Oak. Um, it is truly different uh, than a lot of other places. Um, the, the trees, uh, the road, uh, and the, most importantly, the people. Uh, so much so that when I came home from that day of walking, I went to my wife and I said, you know, if a house ever became available on Harper Street, I'd like to live there. Uh, it's the kind of place that would be a great place. In fact, we looked a, a year later at a, at a house on the street very seriously. Uh, so I know this, uh, I know Live Oak and I know uh, this street very well. And the process in which we've uh, gone through on this has been unusual, um, slightly torturous, uh, because we were turning a park site into a housing site in the middle of a recession. And so we, there were a lot of false starts. There were, there were uh, things that uh, didn't work out about this. There were, uh, um, promises made, uh, there were processes that were discussed, there were processes that were changed um, as part of this. Uh, and so I understand the frustration of the neighborhood uh, because uh, it's, at times it has been hard getting uh, good information out of the county, reliable information, um, uh, sometimes getting the same, asking the same question and getting different answers. So uh, as a representative of the county, I apologize for that. Uh, I take responsibility for it, actually. Uh, this, uh, when we decide to make this a housing resource, we did this in the, f in the final moments uh, when the redevelopment law was uh, created, uh, or was, when the redevelopment law was gonna uh, eliminate redevelopment agencies. And uh, I, I, 
rue the day that I even participated in that discussion because it's only bought, brought bad things to me uh, as part of that. I wish we had spent more time and had more time to be able to discuss it. Uh, I think people should know something about Live Oak is that it's an inclusive community that has been supportive of lots of different projects. And in fact, uh, some of these same folks have came, come out uh, and supported the, uh, the new project that we're gonna be building on Capitola Road, uh, on Bromer Street. There's another 13 units of uh, housing uh, within Compass. Uh, the Live Oak School District's looking at increasing housing on their properties. So uh, Live Oak uh, does a lot to, uh, to, to meet the needs of affordable housing. But we're an inclusive community because that's what we do. Um, when, uh, through this process, uh, the thing that I have uh, tried very hard is try to keep clear communications and uh, work with all sides involved. I, uh, it's been a disappointing process, not only because uh, some of the county information has changed, uh, but the partners have changed and the way in which those partners have interacted with the public has been dispiriting. Uh, the neighborhood has lots of questions. Have, they have had lots of questions about this project, its size, and they wanted to share it with Habitat for Humanity. But when they met with the executive director at the site, they were, uh, they were not given a, a, a fair hearing of those questions. They were dismissed. And when they decided that they should go see the board of directors, they told them they were coming, and when four or five of them showed up, they were given a total of five minutes to address the board. That's not partnership. So it's, it's disturbing because the, as I look at it, these neighbors, they aren't, that, that, that most of them have spent their careers in public service. Firefighters, teachers, uh, uh, folks who've worked for public agencies, universities. Um, these are people who have committed their lives to the public. And so they have a reasonable expectation that, that the, the public sector and its partners are gonna work with them. And um, that hasn't happened. So when, uh, when the, the executive director of Habitat for Humanity says we've worked on participation and tried to be responsive, that's just not accurate. And I can tell you from my personal experience, after meeting with the executive director and, and the board chair, talking about the number of units in this project, when the concern was raised that the cost would be greater uh, if there were fewer projects and uh, fewer units, and I, I offered uh, to raise the money, I haven't been a professional fundraiser, for the seven and a half years before I became a uh, supervisor, and having staff members who, who've done that, we were prepared to raise the, the money necessary to make that possible. We never heard back from um, Habitat, and in a, then uh, to add insult to injury in a public meeting, uh, when asked, the, the executive director uh, said he didn't trust me. So that's not partnership either. Um, there are legitimate concerns, and I hope my colleagues have actually walked this street, because it is different. The first part of the street is a wider street, and there's parking, and then when you get to the place where this is, um, a project is proposed, the street is significantly narrowed. And um, one of the reasons why you have to have parking on site is there is no on-street parking in this portion of Harper. Not just a few spaces, zero spaces. For the reasons that people uh, uh, have <laughs> acknowledged that you, right now you can't even get two cars across uh, there at the same time. So, um, so those concerns are real, and I'm glad that the fire chief wants to take a look at that uh, to ensure that their vehicles can get in there because safety and traffic have been the primary issues that the neighborhood has raised uh, regularly. Um, one of the concerns that I had just a couple weeks ago when this board chose the density bonus program is that not every neighborhood is appropriate for density. This is a great example of it. Not only are there physical limitations 
uh, 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 to the space. But you're turning people who are supportive or willing to help, would be people who would help construct these homes, and you're turning them into uh, opponents. And one of the things I tried to express to Habitat was try to find a way to work with people because the people that you choose for these homes are gonna be the neighbors, and do you really want that to be the setup that you have uh, where you have opponents uh, to a project, and those folks who move in will, will will only have to deal with the, the process that came before them. So um, it, it's, uh, it's slightly insulting, not slightly, it is insulting to think that these folks haven't advocated for uh, improvements of their street um, uh, previous to this and have, uh, have somehow uh, ginned up their concerns uh, with the, the, this process. When I walked that street in, in 2008, people talked to me about the road. It was in terrible condition. When I got elected, one of the first things I did is, is get the street paved. It was, it was, it was, a, it was a pretty crappy road uh, before that. We didn't have the money at the time. Um, I mean, it was on the list. I didn't understand the list uh, for redevelopment projects at the time. We never seriously considered it for sidewalks that I was aware of. Um, and the redevelopment agency uh, disappeared pretty soon thereafter. So that wasn't an opportunity. But I'm glad we got the, the road at least paved. But these residents have been bringing up these concerns for a while. So they haven't, they haven't just fabricated them as part of this process. These are legitimate concerns that we should address and have failed so far. Um, to those who think that um, this is also going to, you know, solve the housing crisis, you know, that every unit is important, but we approved another uh, 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 gift of parkland to Habitat for Humanity in 2011 to build seven homes. And as the executive director said, they're not done yet. They, there's only five of those homes that have been built. So, you know, be clear that this isn't an immediate uh, panacea to, uh, to the housing crisis. Uh, this is, uh, the, the way they do it, and I understand it, is you have to raise the money to build the homes to, 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 to get them built, and then you have to raise the money to build the home and, and so forth. That's the way it works. But this is not immediate relief. Um, uh, f for anyone else. And so um, this process took a long time because we had to go through a process of a request for proposals and everything else. It wasn't that the, that the county was stalling on this project. I'm also concerned um, about uh, using this as a PUD, a planned unit development, because when we revised our planned unit development ordinance, we uh, I know because I've got the language in there about specific benefits that would accrue as part of this. And at the time, I said, well, you can't have something general like it's going to provide jobs or it's, it's just going to um, provide housing. You, there were supposed to be sp specific benefits. And uh, having a long driveway that you can still see the trees is not really a specific benefit. Having good construction and nice design is not a specific benefit. And so uh, I think it's a slippery slope that we operate on because we're gonna see lots of planned unit development that we should be looking for specific community benefits. Um, we put that language in, a previous board put that language in because recognizing that you would see different kinds of development, the development that would be different uh, than what was currently zoned that you needed to provide specific benefits to, uh, to deal with the fact that you were making uh, possible general plan changes or other changes. This, to me, does not meet that measure. Um, I think this project could proceed, and I would make a motion that we uh, adopt the recommended actions, but limit it to 10 units instead of 11 units, 
because um, I think there's a way to, 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 to make this project work under that configuration uh, that, would, uh, that would meet the needs of the neighborhood um, and, uh, and Habitat for Humanity and the housing that's uh, gonna be necessary. So that's my motion. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Hearing no second, I'll now, uh, are you finished with your comments? Yeah, well I just, uh, just say that I cannot support this project at this size at this time. Um, not because I don't uh, uh, want to address the uh, affordable housing crisis. I think that the community is doing more than its fair share. I, I caution the board that we're going to be faced with other um, challenges like this when we say that density should be everywhere. We had a community conversation, and that community conversation said let's have, uh, th there was community buy-in on increased density on transit corridors. It wasn't everywhere. Um, and we are breaking that social contract <clears throat> when we decide that density should be anywhere. So I can't support this project. Super <laughs> Supervisor Friend. I do appreciate the comments of my colleague, and I've been out on Harper Street repeatedly. Actually, I have a very close friend that lived on Brazil, and another that lives actually on Harper just past where this development is. So I'm, I'm very familiar uh, with the street and, and, and know the constraints that they discussed. I do think that the constraints, uh, that there are issues that could be addressed outside of this project scope. Um, I know that you are an excellent advocate for uh, your district, and I know that you'll continue to work on that uh, in regards to this. I think that the fire chief um, will have an important say in this in the interim time. I, I do think that this has been a project that's been discussed for quite some time. I do think uh, that this is actually one of the challenges that the county is going to face in general with state changes on density, state changes with by right ADU. I mean, one could make an argument that based on the current zoning, you could build large single family homes there that with by right ADUs would actually be more units than even is being proposed right now. Um, and these are the things that are being done outside of the scope of, of uh, county ordinances or county approach. And when you have a housing crisis across the state, disproportionately impacting coastal California, but we have more land use constraints than other locations within California. This story that's playing out on Harper is no different than it's going to be playing out across uh, coastal areas throughout the state of California, and I think you are right that we're going to be faced uh, with these decisions. I do think that, that on balance, though, this is, is the correct project for the area. Um, I think that it's a very difficult thing uh, uh, to approve affordable housing projects in general in the sense that uh, there rarely seems to be, until recently, a constituency that supports housing period. There rarely seems to be, as a subset of that, a constituency that ever supports affordable housing. And then there's disproportionately uh, never a constituency that supports it in certain areas of the county, uh, including my district, uh, which hasn't historically had its fair share, such as areas of your district and areas of Supervisor Caput's district, although that has been changing. And at some point, uh, there has to be a recognition that this has to be harmonized throughout the entire county. It has to be harmonized in locations uh, throughout the entire state. Um, I'll move the recommended actions with the additional direction that there be a meeting uh, before the recordation of the map uh, with the fire chief, uh, public works, and planning staff to ensure that whatever concerns uh, and minor amendments that the fire chief uh, comes up with or his representative uh, be incorpororated in. I'll second that. All right, we got a motion by friend and a second by McPherson. Yeah, I um, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I, first of all, I have walked the uh, the street as well, and um, you know, recognizing that this was uh, what started almost two years ago now with 12 units, and I remember we went through a hearing to reduce it to 11, um, and now we're we're uh, arriving uh, at at 11. And we have to recognize that we are in a housing crisis. We have talked about that, especially in recent times. Um, and this is the kind of project we need, we need to meet the demands of the people of Santa Cruz County with all affordable housing and with the reduction in the, the original uh, proposal. Um, 
at 11 units, it meets the parking requirements. Uh, it is uh, allowed to uh, enhance uh, resource prote protection. I think that's important. Um, it is with stated, Habitat could have proposed as many as 17 units with a density bonus. And um, just as a reminder, just recently this board approved an enhanced density bonus program to recently encourage more affordable units in Santa Cruz County. So to deny this at this point, after two years of oversight and a lot of discussions, and I can understand the neighbor's concerns, but I think if we do not approve this as proposed, we're gonna be sending a mixed message. Of do we want affordable housing units in this county or don't we? So I will be supporting the motion and I do appreciate the fact that we will have more input from the, the fire district and uh, I think this is a project that is, we're gonna see more of this type of a proposal in the future, but I do appreciate what Habitat, humanity, its patience and uh, its adjustments it's made to get this far. Supervisor Caput. You bet. Uh, in the beginning, I was for uh, a little bit smaller project. Uh, when it was first proposed, I think it was gonna be 17, 16, 17 units. I'd, I'd give you a perspective from South County. Uh, we've been putting in uh, affordable housing for the last probably 15 years. Uh, projects that are on uh, parcels, not much bigger, maybe a half an acre bigger, than this, uh, we put 88 uh, units uh, about five years ago. Uh, we're just uh, finished about six months ago putting in 42 units in a parcel in uh, District 4, my district, on a, uh, and the, uh, the parcel area is uh, about two acres also. So what I'm getting at is you're looking at something that is about an acre and a half and 11, uh, I think, is a, is a good number. I mean, it, I want to see it spread out throughout the county, and I want to thank uh, the other supervisors. Uh, they have been doing that. Uh, there was a period years ago when uh, everything was South County, everything was District 4, was building affordable housing. Uh, that's not true. Everybody's kind of pitching in. We do have a housing problem. Uh, I'm not for spreading out and uh, having urban sprawl everywhere. I, I want to see smart growth. That's the, uh, the key words there. And uh, the only way we can do that is for everybody to kind of share a little bit of the responsibility and carry uh, part of the load. So I, I believe this is uh, uh, helping us out. Uh, there's state mandates. There's a lot of pressure being put on every community. <coughs> to build more and more housing. And I think in a way, uh, with 11 units, it, it's, uh, uh, I think it's very reasonable in my opinion. So I'm, I'm for the motion also. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a few comments, uh, then we'll call for a vote. So this project is compliant with our general plan, our zoning ordinance, our housing element. It meets all the setback requirements. It meets the parking requirements. It meets the lot coverage requirements. Uh, it meets uh, every requirement that we've set forward, and I think it's important that when we have rules, those who comply by the rules have some certainty about where they end up at the end of the process. I appreciate that Habitat for Humanity has reached out and made changes to the project based on uh, the neighborhood concerns. I have been on, I, been, I did go out and walk Harper Street and saw uh, the impacts. I think they can be addressed uh, through other mechanisms and this one project doesn't uh, drive all the, the parking and the traffic on the street. Um, I will say, uh, as was mentioned, the governor is currently proposing to take away our transportation dollars and the state legislature is proposing to take away our land use authority because their view is uh, that we are not producing the affordable housing that's needed in this state. Um, when we go up to uh, Sacramento, we make a, uh, a, a lot of pledges that we will do our fair share, we will meet the needs, and in this case, we have a 100% affordable housing project, which is a tremendous community benefit. Uh, we have 11 units 
on a one and a half acres, and I'd be hard pressed to go back to the state uh, and say, well, we can, you know, we could do six units, we could do five units on one and a half acres. That doesn't pass the straight face test, and frankly, they will take away our authority to regulate these, uh, these make these decisions at all, and the transportation dollars uh, to improve our infrastructure because um, because we aren't we wouldn't be doing our job. And so I'm confident this is a good project. It meets our responsibility. Finally, let me just say um, I've worked with Habitat. I've volunteered on projects here. I've volunteered on projects in Guatemala and Louisiana. It's an amazing organization. Uh, they do a lot uh, to meet the needs of the community. And when you go to the ribbon cuttings and you meet the families who put in sweat equity and then are going to be living uh, and thriving in our community. Uh, it's really a unique, remarkable experience, and, um, and I I'm, I'm look forward to partnering with Habitat for Humanity more on more opportunities uh, because what they do is so thoughtful, because the benefits they bring are so remarkable, um, and uh, there are 11 very lucky families uh, that we will be able to have uh, continue to live in this community um, when this project is done, and so I'm grateful for their work. So with that, I will uh, call the vote. So uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. So that passes uh, four to one. That concludes our uh, meeting today. Uh, we will adjourn our meeting until our next regularly scheduled uh, meeting, and thank you everyone for coming out and uh, speaking today.